Hello. So in this video, we're going to talk about Euripides' play, The Phoenician Women. This is part of, again, the sort of broadly conceived Theban cycle, um, including the events of the Seven Against Thebes, uh, which is just, uh, which, which is actually kind of during this play. Um, this is, however, a very different take on the Theban cycle than what most people would know from Sophocles' Theban cycle, um, Oedipus the King, Oedipus at Colonus, and Antigone. Things play out pretty differently here, but we do get the, um, the Argive invasion of Thebes under Polynices, um, and the single combat between Ateocles and Polynices in which they kill one another. That stuff does happen here, but we've got some big differences. Um, and actually, one of the big things I'm going to focus on is how this play, The Phoenician Women, kind of challenges or complicates or undermines Sophocles' Antigone, which is really the one that I think is it's most interesting in relation to. So, the play starts with Jocasta giving a history of Thebes and the house of Oedipus, the house of Laius. Now, one thing that you might note, if you are uh, particularly familiar with the Sophocles Theban cycle, is that Jocasta is still alive at the beginning of the Phoenician women, right? So this is the period when um, um, Polynices has already raised his army from Argos, and he has come to claim the throne of Thebes. In the Sophocles version, in Oedipus the King, Jocasta kills herself before any of that stuff happens. Like, she kills herself basically when it is revealed that she is Oedipus's mother, and he, uh, and he is the one who killed Laius. Also, Oedipus is still alive. We find out from, um, from Jocasta, she says, Now when my sons grew men, they kept their father hidden behind locked doors, hoping his dreadful story, which taxed all invention to conceal, might be forgotten with time. So again, this is very different than what we get in the Sophocles, because in the Sophocles, um, Oedipus is exiled immediately after it's revealed what he has done. He blinds himself, and then Creon is like, hit the bricks, guy. And so Oedipus leaves at that moment, taking Antigone with him. So in the Sophocles, Oedipus leaves Thebes with Antigone. They wander for a while and then they arrive at Colonus near the end of Oedipus's life, at which point we find out that Ateocles or Polynices need Oedipus in order to actually rule Thebes. Um, the, the events of Oedipus at Colonus occur. Oedipus dies. Polynices goes back to raise his army to, uh, to try and conquer Thebes. And so Oedipus is dead by that point. In the Phoenician women, Oedipus is still alive. He's still in the city. He hasn't even left yet. He hasn't even been exiled. He does get exiled at the end of the Phoenician women, so that's kind of a recurring fate for him. But in this version, in this timeline, Oedipus remains in Thebes until after uh, the Seven Against Thebes conflict. Um until after Ateocles and Polynices killed one another. Um, the other big thing, important thing that we learn from Jocasta's initial speech is that she is attempting to uh, get Polynices and Ateocles to make peace. She, she is trying to avoid the Seven Against Thebes conflict. And so she is actually sent for, a te uh, sent for Polynices, sent for Ateocles, ask Polynices to come into the city under flag of truce so that they can talk through their differences, they can come up with a solution that will be peaceful. Polynices, uh, we, we get this 
lengthy bit in the middle where we have a debate. We have an agon, um, an agonistic conflict between Polynices and Ateocles, with Eucasta as the sort of third figure. This idea of the agon or the, the conflict of ethoses. Yeah, ethos is, I guess. Uh, the conflict of ethical positions is really, really central to Greek tragedy, especially for somebody uh, like Hegel, uh, who was a, a very influential thinker about how tragedy functions. So Polynices makes his claim basically that it is now his right to rule Thebes under the agreement that Ateocles and he had made before Polynices went into voluntary exile. Ateocles makes his claim largely on the basis of, I have absolute power in Thebes and I'm not going to give it up unless I'm forced to. This is not really a stance that either the Greek gods or the citizens of Greece tended to uh, be very sympathetic to. So this is not likely to have won many supporters uh, from uh, from from the Athenian audience, particularly because the Athenian audience was democratic, um, and so they ideologically opposed authoritarian power. And in fact, the chorus does say, only a noble action shall deserve my praise. This action is not noble. It affronts justice. So the chorus, who to, to a certain extent at least are aligned with the citizens, uh, in in, uh, in Athenian tragedy, condemn Ateocles for his ethical position. Uh, Eucasta urges compromise and moderation. She tries to get each of them to see reason and to avoid bloodshed. Um, and basically, she says, Ateocles, here is the re here are the reasons why your stance is wrong. Polynices, here are the reasons why your stance is wrong. So. Peace is not brokered. Um, Polynices goes back out to the Argive army. Ateocles makes preparations for the battle from within Thebes. There's some debate between Ateocles and Creon about what exactly they should do, what the best strategy is, etc., etc. Some detail, detail, detail. Um, and then they send for Tiresias. Now, interestingly enough, uh, Ateocles has Creon sent for Tiresias because Ateocles has mocked Tiresias's powers of prophecy, and Creon hasn't. So Creon does not like Ateocles, but he does like Creon. Now, that's really striking for people who uh, remember their Antigone. Because in Antigone, it is, of course, Creon, who antagonizes Tiresias and accuses him of having taken bribes to make false prophecies. So here we have quite the opposite. What uh, Tiresias says is that in order for Thebes to win the battle, um, Creon's son Menachius must be sacrificed. Ares is upset. He has an age-old grudge against Thebes because when Cadmus, the mythical founder of Thebes, arrived, he slew a dragon that was sacred to Ares, and he, he uh, buried the dragon's teeth in the earth out of which grew up these stalwart warriors. Ares is upset because his dragon was killed, and so uh, Creon needs to sacrifice Menachius in order to make Ares happy. Um, basically, Creon is like, no, I'm not doing that. And so he tells Menachius to uh, slip out of the city, basically to uh, escape and live in exile. Um, Menachius is like, Okay, sounds good. And then he, and then once Creon leaves, Menachius goes to the chorus and he's like, yeah, I'm not going to do that because I'm not a coward and I don't want people to think of me as a coward. So I am going to go to this cave and I'm going to sacrifice myself 
because that's the thing that's the the thing that will show my courage and will honor my city of Thebes. So that's what he does. Um, Thebes ends up winning uh, the battle, but then Ateocles and Polynices challenge one another to single combat. And this is a weird bit for me because, right, typically in Greek tragedy, you try and avoid your fate, right? If you're So if you're Laius, their grandfather, and you get a prophecy that if you have a kid, that kid will murder you, the first thing you do is say, not if I murder that kid first. So you attempt to murder that kid. But then fate turns out to be a tricky little bitch and is like, ah, actually, surprise, you didn't murder your kid successfully. <laughs> your kid grew up thinking that somebody else was his parents, and now he's murdered you at a crossroads for no good reason. And then through another twist of fate, he's now marrying his mom, your former wife, because you failed, because literally doing the thing that you tried to do to avoid your fate is what set in motion the events that would lead to your fate. That's normally how it works. Somebody has a prophecy, they try and avoid carrying out that, that prophecy that will doom them, and then that puts in motion what will doom them. The Teocles and Polynices take the opposite approach. They have a prophecy that they will murder each other, that they will stabby, 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 both of us dead. And they're like, fuck yes. I want to fight you to the death personally. I demand that we do this. Yeah, it is the opposite of what you're supposed to do in Greek tragedy. They embrace their fate, and they they could have just not fought one another. Like, that was perfectly a legitimate option. But they are literally like, not only will I, I want to. I demand to. I will accept nothing less than us slaughtering each other. Even though I know that's what's going to happen because of prophecy. So it's a very weird twist there in terms of how that works. Um, from there, Ateocles and Polynices are dead. Um, Yocasta goes out to the battlefield to try and stop them from slaughtering one another. She finds that she has gotten there too late, so she kills herself. Um, Creon is now in charge of Thebes because everybody else is dead, and he's basically like, all right, Oedipus, time to, time to go into exile. Hope you like, hope you like the road, because that's where you're going to be living from now on. And Antigone goes with him, um, so that's how the play ends. Now, the other thing that I think is really interesting is there's a lot of bits and pieces here that um, don't necessarily jive well with what we get from Sophocles' Theban cycle, particularly Antigone. Um, so, one of the things here... Um, Early in the play, Antigone has come out of the palace with her tutor. Uh, they're not supposed to be out there. They're not supposed to be looking at the Argive army or anything like that. Um, but she comes out. We have this bit where the tutor says, Get our enemies come with a just cause. I think that's really interesting because that sort of ethos may inform Antigone's sympathy for Polynices in the Antigone. Um, and then, and then a little bit later, Antigone. So, so the tutor says, "Do you see him about Polynices?" Because they're looking out and identifying the champions. And she says, "Not, not clearly, and yet I think I see the outline of his body." So that's an interesting bit because in the Antigone, her focus is on his body as physical object. And there is this, there is a reading that she has a sort of unnatural or incestuous almost love for Polynices. And what it says here is, not clearly, and yet I think I see the outline of his body that looks like him. Oh, how I wish I could fly like a cloud on the wind, run through the air to my own dearest brother, and fling my arms around his neck. So long he's been absent an unhappy exile, 
Look how splendid he is in his armor of gold like flames of the rising sun. So again, we've got that sort of fascination with Polynices' body. Even though, again, in the Antigone, it is his dead body. Um, yeah, we've got that element of it. A little bit later in the play, we've got more stuff that kind of interestingly informs the Antigone. Um, at one point, Ateocles says to Creon, Now for my sister Antigone, if fortune today deserts me, you must take thought for her marriage with him and your son. As I go out to fight, I know I now ratify the betrothal already made. One of the big sticking points of the Antigone is the, the, the betrothal between Antigone and Haman. So here this is attributed not to Creon the way that it is in the Antigone, but to Ateocles. And so we get this element that... Creon in the Antigone is not necessarily making his own choices so much as he is enacting the the, the late rule commands of Ateocles. We see the same thing here. He says, If I am victorious, Polynices' body must never be given burial here in Theban soil. Any who inters him, even of our family, shall die. This is Creon's edict in the Antigone, but there's no indication in the Antigone that this was Ateocles' desire. Um, and so we've got that element. Like, what does it mean that, Creon, that, that Ateocles is setting up for the things that, that come to mark Creon in the Antigone? Um, Later, we've got this, again, sort of ironic element here. So, they come back to that um, in a couple of different ways. Uh, the most direct one in terms of Creon is that he does make the proclamation, the proclamation that drives the action of the Antigone, at the end of the Phoenician women, he makes the proclamation that no one can bury Polynices' body or they will be subject to death, right? Um, so that, again, is the thing that drives the Antigone. Um, she defies that edict and then is, uh, is executed. Rion here defends it as Ateocles' decisions, not my own. And basically he says... Creon does make a defense of this against Antigone, who basically says, this isn't right, you shouldn't be doing this, etc., etc. So we know that that will eventually become a thing. This is also complicated by two other bits that I think are worth noting. Um, at one point, Creon, um, in talking to the chorus, says, when a man is dead, one who is not yet dead should show by honoring him due piety to the gods of earth. So, in this bit, Freon gives voice to the very sentiment that Antigone will, will centrally argue for in the Antigone, and Creon will take the opposite perspective. We've also got this bit where um, a messenger brings uh, a messenger brings the sort of description of Ateocles and Polynices' fight to the death and Jocasta's suicide there. Um, and what he, he brings Polynices' final words, part of which are um I beg you both, you mother and you sister, bury me in my native land and soothe the resentment of the citizens that I may gain thus much, thus much at least of my own heritage, though I have lost my home. So, again, in the Antigone, she is driven by her own desire to bury Polynices, but here in the Phoenician women, we have 
Polynices himself directly saying, bury my body. This is the thing that I want. So again, there's a lot of interesting moving parts here. The timeline of the Phoenician women really just blows apart um, the timeline that we get from Sophocles. Um, Ateocles is much more active in terms of like setting up the, the events that will come in the Antigone. Creon's position is more complicated. Polynices' position is more complicated. It's, a, it's an interesting play. Um, also, it's worth noting, I meant to mention this at the beginning of the, the thing, uh, there are some people who don't even think that Euripides really wrote this. Um, a lot of the text is contentious. A lot of the text is um, subject to suspicion. It may or may not be accurate. And there are some people who think that this is a later play written in a Euripidean style, but not actually by Euripides at all. 